Okay. What now? <laughs> or now what? <laughs> How many times do we say that or think that at least? And uh, as we reflect on that, just in your own life, what are the, some of the things that you think about? You don't have to tell me, but I can, in fact, uh, as I look around, see some of you and know some of the now what <laughs> that have happened in your life. But just think about that for a minute. In, in the last months, you know, what are some of those now what moments that you've, that you've uh, come up against? And uh, as I think about it, I realized that that's life. I mean, you know, we in fact um, are people who make plans and we try to, to live out our plans, but there's always something unexpected coming up, isn't there? <laughs> it just, it's just natural, it, it's just life, uh, because we're not in control as much as we might think we are about everything that's going on. Uh, <laughs> So as you think about those what now moments, uh, look at this verse. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why do you not even know that what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Do you see that as mostly a negative verse? You know, that we want to make our plans, but we're just a mist and we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And uh, there are those people in life who are Eeyores, you know, uh, who just, you might have known. <laughs> uh, and I suspect that, that so many times we even are almost looking for something bad to happen, or we think of it in that bad sense. Um, and uh, as we, we think of the things that are happening, the challenge for us as believers is to not just look at things negatively or to, to, to say, now what, in that negative sense. It's good for us to try to be as much as we possibly can in, in tune with our Lord and say, well, Lord, this has happened. Now what are you going to do? Now what is going to happen from your perspective? Uh, so the last part of that says, if it is the Lord's will, we'll live and do this or that. Jim was talking about this recently uh, when he was talking about Paul. And, and Paul says, by the will of God, I'm an apostle. By the will of God, this and this and this has happened. You know, and, and the more we are in tune with God, the more we are surrendered to God as fully as we can be, the more that his will can be done and the more that we won't have to look at life in a negative sense, but in fact, we'll be able to see how God is working even in very, very difficult circumstances. I love it when uh, we uh, have uh, positive things uh, happen in, and in our lives, but remember these verses, first Romans eight twenty eight, and we know that in all things, God works for the good, for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. You know, think about your experiences in life and what you learn. When do we learn the most? Well, most of the time it's when things are hard <laughs> and difficult and we struggle and we learn in the midst of those times, don't we? Because if we are surrendered to God and he's working in our lives particularly, even the negative things, we can learn. We can, we can grow in our faith. We can go deeper in our faith. We can, we can learn how to pray better and all of those things, you know, because God is working for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes, who are surrendered. And then, Marie, you, you took my thunder. No, you didn't. <laughs> but it just goes along with what you were saying in Steve, too, this Romans, uh, the latter part of Romans 8. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, there's going to be some, some good things happen in our lives even in the midst of the negative, even in the midst of the hard things, even in the midst of the difficulties. And if you read that in between part, which Marie did, it talks about peril and famine and sword and even death and life. 
even in the midst of those things, if we know that God loves us, if we know that, that He is there with us, nothing, nothing can separate us from His love that's in Christ Jesus. Nothing! <laughs> it might be hard going through it. It might even be that we end up, in, you know, in death. But nothing can separate us from the love of God. His promise is that we'll go to be with him in his kingdom, praise the Lord. Yeah. You know, and, and we have to just appreciate that as we look at life, it isn't so much looking at it like, oh, what now? But like, okay, Lord, we're going through this. Now what? How are you gonna, how are you gonna work? What are you gonna do? How are you going to, to bring us into victory? Oh, I, I want to sing that Victory in Jesus song. Yes, yeah, we were talking about that earlier there. Let's, let's do that one of these days, real soon. Okay, so let's just take a, a look at some examples as we can. Uh, first of all, uh, from um, the Old Testament. And remember Joseph, Joseph was a favorite son. And Joseph, uh, in fact, uh, was uh, so favored that his father gave him extra things. And remember, he had dreams, and he told his dreams to his uh, brothers and to his uh, parents, and they were a little disgusted with him because it seemed like he was saying that somehow they were going to worship him or, you know, that they were going to bow down to him. And the brothers disliked that so much that they um, uh, accosted him one day and, and, uh, and, and sold him into slavery. And he went down to Egypt. Now, that's a pretty negative circumstance, right? He's going down there to Egypt, and, and I bet as he's going, and I, I suspect that it's true that the, they weren't exactly kind to him. I mean, after all, he was a slave. And so he's going down there, and uh, as he's in that circumstance, he was probably saying to himself, what now, Lord? I've been faithful, and I love you, but what now, Lord? And, and so he gets down there, and he's, uh, he's treated harshly at times, and, uh, and falsehoods are told about him, and he ends up in prison, and he interprets some dreams for fellow prisoners. And finally, one of them, after several years, remembers that as he goes back and is with Pharaoh, and he, he's, he tells Pharaoh, well, there's this guy I know, he can interpret dreams. And so, so they bring him out of prison, dress him all up again, clean him up, you know, and, and he goes before Pharaoh and interprets the dreams that Pharaoh has had about the, about the seven years of, of uh, abundance uh, that would be followed by the seven years of famine. And Pharaoh th was so impressed that he said, I'm going to make you my right-hand man, <laughs> you know. And so he did, and, and ultimately Joseph's brothers come and, and his whole family and uh, uh, J Joseph, because of the, the connection he had with God, he is able to, to provide for not only the Egyptians, but for the others that come. And he says to his brothers one time, uh, you know, you meant it for harm, but God meant it for good. Okay, God meant it for good. God put me in this place so that we could all be saved, you know. And so we have to appreciate that the negative, the what now, is a very positive thing when it's in God's hands, okay? Uh, Moses, leading the people out of slavery in Egypt and through the Red Sea. Well, we might say, first of all, that Moses was born, and at that moment in history, it was a pretty rough moment because the Israelites were told to kill all the baby boys. Kill them all, you know? We, we, we got too many, so let's kill them all, the Egyptians said. But uh, uh, his uh, mother uh, just couldn't possibly do that herself, so she put him in a basket, and you know the story. Uh, the, uh, the, the princess uh, came and saw him and took him to the palace, and he was raised in the palace of Pharaoh, a much better circumstance than most of his people, but uh, he was there. And, and uh, after 40 years, he went out and was seeing his own people, and uh, one of the Egyptians was abusing one of his people, and so he killed him. Oh, he should done that probably but anyway he killed him <laughs> and uh, long story short he fled into the wilderness for 40 years and then God said to him 80 years old can you imagine that I'm not 80 yet but <laughs> just starting what God wants you to do uh, he said to Moses okay now I want you to go back to Egypt now I want you to lead the people out of slavery and do you remember how Moses reacted 
He said, oh, can't you send somebody else? Um, I can't talk very good. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> he was trying to make all kinds of excuses. And, but, uh, but God said, no, you're the one to go. And here's what I want you to do. And so he went back and uh, all of those plagues were inflicted upon the Egyptians and some of them on the Israelites, the early ones. Uh, but God ultimately brings them out. And all of the people, I think, were probably, the Israelites were probably shaking their heads, what now, you know, when they're seeing all these things. But ultimately, uh, Moses leads them out and he leads them uh, into the desert area and they go to the Red Sea and oh no, what now? The Egyptian army is coming back after them again. And so they're shaking their heads again, but God opened the sea and they were able to go through on dry land. So the what now, you know, we think of it normally in a negative way, but, but God was there and God was providing. So we could talk about Joshua then leading the people into the promised land. And we think of Joshua and, and that first, yeah, I, you can't even call it a battle. <laughs> you know, that first incident was, uh, was the, the Jericho was there. And so God told him, okay, go and march around the city once and then go be quiet for the night. Get up the next day, go around the city again and then be quiet. And on the seventh day, go around the city seven times and blow your trumpets and the walls fell down. <laughs> and the people may have been saying, what now? This is crazy, a crazy plan. But, but God was at work. God was going to do what God was going to do. Jim talked about Esther recently and her being uh, chosen to be the queen, uh, to replace the one that, that uh, kind of uh, disrespected the king. Uh, and so she's queen and, and, you know, things were really good. But then Haman is there and, and he wants to kill all the, the, the Israelite people. And, and so he's making his plans. But God put her in that plan or in, in that place at the right time for God's plan and God's purposes to save the people. OK. And so, again, uh, those what now, now what moments. All right. Let's look at some of the, the gospel uh, examples that we might think about the events surrounding Jesus birth. First of all, you have Mary, who's just minding her own business, and an angel appears to her. And do you suppose she might have said, now what? <laughs> you know, a, a kind of a, a surprising thing. And then Joseph had the dreams, and uh, then they had to, because of a census that was taken, go to Bethlehem when she was several months pregnant. And... And having arrived there, there weren't very good circumstances, you know. It was a, a manger, as we think of it. And it's like, oh, now what? You know, again and again. And, and then uh, Jesus is born, and then they placed him in a manger, and the shepherds come. And Mary and Joseph were probably looking at each other and like, whoa, what are these guys doing here? You know, and then the wise men came, and it's like, well, now what? You know, the, the, all of those things relating to that. And then they had to flee to Egypt and you know the story goes on but a lot of now what moments that were happening there uh, Jesus uh, after he's grown up uh, is uh, baptized by John the Baptist and the Holy Spirit comes upon him a very spectacular special uh, moment uh, for him as he is ready to begin his ministry but what happens the very first thing the devil grabs him I don't know how whether he grabbed him by the arm or what he did but he's taking him out into the wilderness and the wilderness temptations and I don't know about Jesus saying, now what? Because I think he had a pretty good idea what God's plans were. But those things that the devil was throwing at him were a little kind of rough, you know. And it's like uh, there were tough decisions. But how did Jesus respond? He responded with the word. Remember, he responded with the word. And so those were happening. And then Jesus begins his ministry. And every day there were some new people coming and, and wanting uh, Jesus to help them and to touch them and to heal them and all that. And um, the people as they came, they may have been asking themselves, now what? I'm, is something good going to happen or am I just here and I'll get ignored? Uh, and Jesus and the disciples, you know, they may have in fact uh, said, uh, when all these people were coming, now what are we going to do? Uh, for example, when the, the, the 5,000 were there and they were, they were out there and Jesus 
was teaching and he was healing, but there wasn't any food. <laughs> you know, food's a big deal, isn't it? <laughs> we we kind of like that food. And so they're out there and that, that uh, uh, circumstance was very difficult. And Jesus said, well, what have we got? <laughs> and and they saw a little boy with five loaves and two fish and, and uh, they brought it to Jesus. And Jesus said, yeah, that'll, that'll do. And so he prayed and he divided it. And I, do you think people were saying, no, what? <laughs> you know, but if God is at work, amazing things uh, can happen and do happen. And we could also talk about the, the teachings that, uh, that Jesus uh, gave. And uh, when he was teaching, uh, as Jim was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount, the, the, so much of what he was saying was far beyond anything that the Pharisees and the scribes had been able to share. It was much, much deeper, much uh, broader, much more in tune with who God is and what God wants to do. Uh, just amazing. And so the people were, were probably, as, as Jesus was teaching even, saying, well, now what? He's talking about even if you're angry with somebody, that's like committing murder. And it, yeah, you know, on and on. We could go back on over some of that. But, but I think it's important for us to appreciate that. Um, and the example of Jesus and his disciples in the stormy sea, you know, they're in the boat and Jesus is asleep. And the question that somebody might ask, well, how could he sleep in the middle of a storm? <laughs> you know, but he's there and he's sleeping and the disciples are bailing water and trying to figure out what, how, what's going to happen. And the now what? And, and so they wake Jesus up and say, don't you care if we're perishing? And Jesus said, no, it's okay, guys. And he just spoke and the storm was calmed. Uh, very quickly and they were amazed because if God is at work even in those negative circumstances even in those now what moments God has the authority and Jesus was given that authority and had the authority to do God's will and God's plan and, and it was affecting people uh, we could talk about Lazarus Mary and Martha's brother Lazarus became sick and they called for Jesus hoping he would come and heal Lazarus like he had so many others but Jesus on purpose stayed away. It's like, what? Now what? And so a couple of days later, obviously he goes and, and it was touching him. It, it, I love the one verse there where it says, Jesus wept because he knew the needs. He knew the, the pain that they were feeling. He understood uh, how difficult it was for them. But then he said, well, Lazarus, would you just come out of that tomb? And he did. And you know, another pretty significant now what moment. Did it happen for everybody? No, but, but I want us to appreciate that if God's purposes are involved here, some amazing things can happen. Some amazing things. And to appreciate that. We could talk about all kinds of other examples. But I want to move on and particularly talk about Peter for a couple of minutes here. Well, probably more than that. I get carried away. But uh, let's talk about Peter. The first one that I have up there is when he was called from being a fisherman to be a disciple. Do you remember the details there? Well, it was uh, in Luke's account, it says that Jesus uh, was there by the shore and Peter had been out fishing all night and he hadn't caught anything. And for a fisherman, that's kind of frustrating, you know, not catching anything, especially if it's your livelihood, right? So Peter uh, was there and he was, he was kind of disgusted about it. And, and Jesus said, well, put out and put your nets down and, and see what happens. And so he did. And, and of course, there was a large uh, amount of fish in the net and, and he brought it in. And do you, you know, remember what Peter said? Peter said, go away from me. I'm a sinful man. And Jesus said, I want you to be a fisher of men. <laughs> Oh, did Peter expect that? I don't think so. <laughs> did, did Peter uh, uh, understand that, that Jesus, in fact, was calling him to be transformed and changed? Well, he soon got the idea, right? But, but he, he was a fisherman, and Jesus said, oh, I've got something else in, in mind for you. I've got a plan for you, and that plan is a big one. Well, and so Peter, as he was listening to Jesus talk and so on, he, he, he was, was pretty impressed with him. Um, but the, another storm came up, and in this storm, uh, Jesus isn't with them. He's on the shore. He's praying. Oh, what a wonderful thing. Jesus is often praying, wasn't he? And he's praying, and he sees that the disciples are, are having a hard time in, in this stormy weather. And so he comes to them walking on the water. 
And remember that? And, and uh, Peter, seeing him, and, you know, it's in the night and it's dark, and he said, well, now what? What is that? <laughs> well, it was Jesus coming to him on the water. And so he spoke to him, and Peter said, well, if it really is you, let me walk to you. And so he gets out of the boat and walks, and I don't know why. He, Peter is always making interesting <laughs> decisions, wasn't he? Yeah, but he, he's walking on the water, and he's walking to Jesus. And then he stops and thinks for it about it a second and says, wait a minute, I'm not supposed to be able to do this, you know. And so... So he starts to sink, but Jesus quickly rescues him because Jesus had purposes for him. And certainly that one of his purposes wasn't for him to drown. So, you know, he, sa he saves him. And, uh, and there, um, uh, again, uh, looking at a negative circumstance in a positive way. Um, and so Peter, every day he was with Jesus and hearing his teaching and, and seeing the miracles and, and probably uh, every day was wondering, well, now what? Now, now what's going to happen? You know, looking for God to be at work uh, through Jesus. Well, and it was not only seeing all of that, but then Jesus does an amazing thing. And Peter was one of the 12 that, that was involved in this. Jesus said to him, okay, you've been seeing all these miracles. You've been listening to my teaching. Teaching. Now I got a job for you. I want you to go out and teach, and I want you to go out and and heal people. And Peter, uh, with the others, probably said, uh, "What? You know, I like the gym when he says that. Oh, uh, what? <laughs> so it, it's one of those things that uh, that Peter, along with the others, did go out and did teach and did heal." And they were amazed that, that they could do that. Why? Because they were just human beings, you know, and they didn't know how to do all this stuff or they didn't know that they had the capacity to do any of that. But Jesus gave them the authority to teach, gave them the authority uh, to, to work and move in his uh, powerful ways. And uh, so it, it goes on. Well, um, when uh, one day Jesus was talking to him again and uh, he said, well, who do people say I am right now? Who are people uh, claiming that I am? And so, well, one of the prophets or whatever. And then Jesus turned to Peter and said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter had seen enough, experienced enough, uh, had, had, had his, his whole thinking transformed. He said, well, well, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. You're the, you're the Messiah. And Jesus commended him for that. And he basically says, well, I think God gave you that in understanding and appreciation. But yeah, yeah, that's right. That's who I am. And so uh, that was a, a very great moment uh, when, when he made that great confession. Well, uh, then a little later on, uh, Jesus took uh, uh, some of the disciples, not all of them, with him up on, on the mountain. And on that mountain, uh, Jesus started glowing. <laughs> I like that, you know, he just started glowing and they were all pretty interested in that. And, and Elijah and Moses came to him and uh, they were talking together. And Peter is like, oh, this is amazing. Now what? Now what? Now what? And so he said, ah, I got it. We'll build you a little shelter so you guys can sit and, and, and talk together. And of course, uh, that didn't last very long. They didn't get the shelters built. But but Peter saw saw the transformation of Jesus, transfiguration, if you want to use that word. Well, uh, that was pretty amazing. But another thing that was hard for Peter was when Jesus kept talking about going to Jerusalem and being crucified. He did not like that one bit. That didn't fit into his plans. It didn't seem to make sense to him. But that's what Jesus kept saying. And he was struggling with that. And, um, and Jesus, nope, that's what it's going to be. It's got to be that way. That's, that's God's intention. That's God's plan. But he struggled with that. Well, as he struggled with that, um, it, Jesus kept on trying to help them to see and appreciate uh, God's working, God's plan. And uh, a little later on, uh, when um, Jesus uh, celebrated the Passover with them, this is just the, the night before he's crucified, what happens? Well, um, I didn't put this down on there, but, uh, but the, remember that when they were uh, celebrating that Passover, Jesus took off his outer garment and he took 
a, a basin of water and he went and he was going to wash the disciples' feet and he came to Peter and what did Peter say? Well, uh, uh, you, you shouldn't be washing my feet. Uh, and uh, Jesus said, I've got to do what I've got to do right now. And Peter finally recognizing who Jesus is and you got to do what Jesus said. He said, okay, well, if you're going to wash my feet, wash all of me, you know, <laughs> my head and my hands and everything, you know. And so Peter was trying to get it, but it was a struggle for him, you know. It's like, what now? What's, what's going on? Uh, and uh, so uh, they went from there, then out to the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus picked Peter and a couple of others, and he said, okay, we're going over here, and we're going to pray. I mean, all of you can pray, but, we're, you know, we're going over here, and I want you to pray. And what did Peter do? Uh, he fell asleep. And Jesus came back and he said, well, couldn't you stay awake with me one hour and pray? And I think Peter was feeling pretty sheepish and feeling kind of bad and, and, and you know, wondered what kind of consequences there would be for that. But Jesus went away and prayed again. And what did Peter do? Fell asleep again. <laughs> three times he fell asleep. And three times Jesus came back. And, and, and then... The soldiers came uh, to to arrest Jesus, the court guard and all of that. And, and as they came, Peter said, I've got to redeem myself. I've got a sword here. I'm going to fight. <laughs> so he pulls out his sword. And as he's, he's taken the sword, he's whoosh, and it cuts off the uh, ear of this uh, high priest servant. And he was going to defend Jesus. He really did not want this Saul to, to go down like it was seemingly it was going to. And Jesus, you know, goes over to the servant. And he said, no, this isn't right. And he touches him and heals the servants here. And Peter's like, well, now what? If I can't defend him, now what? You know, and, and he was really struggling with that. Okay, so they go from there um, and uh, it, uh, the, uh, the soldiers and so on take uh, Jesus to the high priest's uh, uh, palace and, and they're going to gonna do everything they can to destroy Jesus and Peter uh, follows along and he goes and um, he's not at all sure what's going to happen but he goes and he's there and somebody comes and says well aren't you one of the disciples you know, oh, no, not me <laughs> he was pretty quick to deny that and he ended up denying three times that he even knew Jesus, basically. Uh, and, and it was a really hard thing. But then a rooster crowed. And remember, Jesus had told Peter, you'll deny me three times before the rooster crows. Ooh, Peter was really struggling, I think, with all of that. But God was still at work. God was still at work. And God had plans and purposes. Um, after Jesus is crucified, uh, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb, and the tomb is open, and the angels tell her that Jesus is alive. He has been resurrected. And so she goes and tells Peter and the others, and Peter said, oh, now what? And he runs to the tomb to see what's going on, and Jesus' body isn't there. But he struggles to believe, it says in John's Gospel, that he, that he couldn't believe that Jesus was resurrected. Well, thankfully, Jesus appears to all of them. And so, so they now know that he's resurrected. And so that's all wonderful. But now what? <laughs> uh, and so uh, after Jesus uh, was resurrected, he told them to go to Galilee. And that he would, would see them there and meet them there. And do you remember the account? Well, the, Peter and the others are up there and they're kind of waiting and the, the, Jesus hasn't immediately arrived. And so Peter kind of impatient, like Peter, I think was, says, I don't know what to do. I'm going fishing. <laughs> you know, that's what he knew. That's what he knew. He, he was a fisherman. He, he was going to go fishing. And so, of course, we know that, that Jesus came. Uh, to where they were and to their fishing. And again, he hadn't caught anything. So Jesus had cast your net on the right side of the boat and they brought in a, a large, large haul of fish and, and, and they all recognized, yeah, that's Jesus again. And what did Jesus do with Peter at that particular time? Well, he, he called him aside and he said, Peter, do you love me? <laughs> and Peter said, yeah, Lord, sort of. <laughs> I, he, you know, he used a different word uh, in the Greek. And so, so you know, he, he said, yeah, I love you. And she said, if you do, 
feed my sheep. And he said to him again, do you love me? Uh, yeah, well, feed my lambs. And basically, Jesus is trying to help him see, it's okay, you've done all these things, but it's still okay. I have purposes for you, and they're going to be great purposes, and you're going to, to be a significant instrument in my hands to help others come to, come to me. You know, feed my sheep, feed those who, who would come to me. And it was a struggle for Peter. And of course, this is before Pentecost, and, and uh, I'm going to actually change order here a little bit. Uh, but uh, uh, after Jesus um, had, had said these things to him a little later, he gave them, uh, gave them uh, directions about the, the kingdom coming and that they would receive the Holy Spirit and all of that. But I, I don't know whether you remember, but... When uh, Jesus was telling them that, uh, Peter, I think, and the others said, well, okay, that's, that's awesome, you know, you're, you're, you're going to restore, you're going to establish the kingdom. But he says it in an interesting way. Uh, he asked when Jesus is going to restore the kingdom to Israel. And my guess is that they were still not completely grasping God's bigger plan. They were thinking of the Israelites and, okay, now the Israelites are going to be established again as the chosen people of God and, and, and the, the kingdom is going to be there and we're going to be able to, to, to celebrate this kingdom. But God had a much bigger plan, didn't he? He was thinking of the whole world, you know, and, and a kingdom that goes way beyond uh, just the, the Israelites. And so uh, he, he gets that word, and then uh, when they get that word, uh, Jesus is saying, you know, um, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And then what happened? Well, Jesus uh, was just standing there, and all of a sudden, he floats up into the air. And I imagine that Peter and the others are saying, what? Now what? <laughs> you know, he's gone. He's, he, he's up there. And uh, two men in white came and they said, it's okay. It's okay. He'll come back in the same way he is gone. It's okay. Here, remember the promise. And remember the promise of the Spirit. It's okay. God's working here. And in ways that you can't understand, probably. Now, I, they, I don't know whether they said all that, but, but uh, that's what happened. And so, so Peter and the others uh, went back, and they were spending time praying. And Peter takes a little bit of leadership in helping uh, to choose one to replace Judas Iscariot. Um, and uh, it could have been any of them, but, but Peter seemed to be the one, okay, I'll, I'll stand up and do that. And then after they, they did that, they were in prayer, and they were waiting for the promised Holy Spirit. Do you think they had any idea? how God was going to do it, how God was going to bring the Holy Spirit upon them in a special way. Well, I don't think so. I think they were uh, believing it was going to happen, but they didn't exactly know how. They were, they were praying, as they should have been, and believing that God was going to act, but they didn't know how this promised gift of the Spirit was going to come. I think at each point up to this, uh, this moment, Peter was no doubt wondering, you know, what now, now what, and, and recognizing that if God is at work, we may not know uh, what's going to happen, but if God is at work, he is with us, he loves us, and his purposes will be fulfilled particularly as we cooperate, as we are eager to do that. Um, and he was going to have a lot of more what now moments even after this, if you read through the book of Acts and some of the things that happened. There were a lot more things that go on. Okay, to Acts chapter 2. And spend just a few moments here, but, but first, when they were praying, it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Uh, do you know what the, the day of Pentecost is all about? Pentecost is the 50th day after the Sabbath, uh, Sabbath fifth, uh, Penta means 50, so it's, it's the 50th day after the Sabbath of Passover week. You can read about it in Leviticus 23, and thus the first day of the week. It's also called the Feast of Weeks. It's also called the Feast of Harvest. It's also called the Day of First Fruits. And I, I think it's interesting that God chose that day to pour out his spirit. Why? Well, because I, I believe that, that part of the reason is that, that because the Holy Spirit was coming in a new and significant and powerful way, it was the beginning of the, the kingdom of God coming, you know, and building. 
Um, we've uh, looked at some of the parables relating to, to the kingdom, and one of my favorites is the, you know, the kingdom is like uh, a mustard seed, you know, tiny, tiny, tiny. And when you think of how the kingdom starts, it, it, it's kind of tiny, but as people come and respond to God, respond to, to what God is doing, it grows because people become a part of that kingdom because they believe in Jesus and they trust him as Lord and Savior, and, and, and they're responsive. So uh, these uh, calling it the day of first fruits, I think, is, is a significant thing. So how many were there gathered in one place? It said they were gathered there all there in one place. Well, um, some think it was a house. And if it was just the 12, I suppose they could have. But I think it was more than just the 12. I think there were a number, as it says in the previous chapter there, who were praying. Uh, and uh, there maybe were as many as 120 from verse 15 of chapter 1. Uh, so there wouldn't have been very many houses big enough for all that. And so I have thought over the years, Years that uh, I believe they were at the temple because the temple was obviously the center of so much, you know, going on. And there were rooms at the temple for, for bigger gatherings. I mean, um, as we, we think about the temple, they had several different rooms where, where uh, larger groups could gather. And because, you know, if God's going to do something, what a better place to do it. You know, there is no better place to do it, perhaps, than, than at the temple. So... I think they maybe were, were in a room at the temple. And remember, the temple was called God's house on some occasions. So I think that's worth, worth reflecting on. Uh, and then verse 2, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. You know, God works in interesting ways. Um, but why the sound of the, of the wind? You know, it doesn't seem like there was any destruction. Uh, that wouldn't be right. You know, God wouldn't want to destroy. But the sound was there, and it seems like it was this sound that drew people and people that were uh, in and around the temple or in, in Jerusalem, and they were probably saying, well, what in the world is that? What is that? And they were drawn to where the disciples, uh, the believers were, uh, to find out, you know, to find out what's going on. So, you know, the now what is not just for, for the believers, but it's, it's for everybody, you know, and they're wondering, what, what is going on? Uh, and so did the ex disciples exactly expect this? I don't think so. I, I, they knew the Holy Spirit was supposed to come, but how and in, in what way? Well, I don't think they really knew. And, you know, it would be nice, I suppose, if God had, a, had a, a plan all laid out for us so we could say, okay, this is going to happen, and then this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and this is how it's going to happen. Wouldn't it be nice if God's plan was all laid out and real clear for us? We'd mess it up. We, we'd mess it up. <laughs> I think we'd not only mess it up, but we would probably be like Peter was on a few different occasions and say, Oh, no, that, that, that can't be right. <laughs> yeah, but when, when God is working and God is moving, it's going to be his way. And we may not expect it, but we need to be open and ready. And so that's, I think, a key thing here. And, and um, when uh, the sound came, I, I think we just have to appreciate that it was God's way of getting people's attention. And so, so they did. Uh, it doesn't seem like it was any earthly phenomenon, uh, but something from God, the Holy Spirit coming with great power and another now what moment. And in fact, you might remember Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, 8, the wind blows where it pleases. You hear it sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. When the Spirit comes upon us, you know, we can't see it. It's like, okay, where is it? Why? Yeah. <laughs> you know, we can't see it, but, but we can sense it, we can know it, and we can know it from the inside out, you know, as we're connected with God. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an awesome thing. And probably some of us will have similar experiences, but I think for each one of us, it's going to be unique. Why? Because we're unique. And the Spirit deals with each of us in a unique and special way, I think. And so that's, I think, helpful to, to think about. Okay, and so then they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. <laughs> you know, fire. 
and when we think of fire, uh, it seems again that there wasn't any destruction. But but why God cho chose this to 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 be there as a as a sign or as an evidence of His presence is pretty interesting uh, to reflect on. And we don't know all the details, but the bottom line is that that uh, they saw it and it was coming upon them. And I don't think they were afraid, but I think they were wondering, uh, now what? <laughs> uh, and so as they reflected on it, uh, what are some of the other times uh, when uh, fire appears in Scripture indicating the presence of God? Well, I'll maybe have you guess. What, what are a couple of those that you could... Burning bush. Oh, I love that one, you know. Uh, that Moses is out there in the wilderness and he's, he's uh, just paying his own attention, paying attention to the sheep and watching him and so on and sees this bush on fire. It's kind of like right now, things are pretty dry, you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and fire is a dangerous thing, right? But, but it wasn't being destroyed. How come? How come? And so he walks over to look and, and what, did, what did God say to him? Moses, well, I'd like to yell it, but I won't do that. <laughs> Moses, take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground. When God is moving, it's holy ground, you know, and, and it's, it's important and special to appreciate that. And, and so Moses, I think, sh sh flipped off his sandals pretty quick, and it's like, oh, okay, now what, now what? So, but, but that was certainly one. What's another one when you, you think of, of fire and God's presence? Even that prophet calmed down the fire. Oh, yeah, yeah, God said, Rrr! <laughs> when they were were uh, uh, bad, when somebody else said something over here, the pillar, of fire. Uh, the, the pillar of fire. Yeah, when they were when they were there in the wilderness, God said, "Well, we, uh, you know, I'm not going to stand in their midst all the time in the in you know a physical appearance, but but I'll have this pillar of fire or pillar of cloud that will guide them wherever I want them to go, and it was a sign of God's presence." Okay, but we could think of some others. For example, we could think of the of the uh, time when um, the fire and the smoke are on Mount Sinai when the commandments were given. Given, it wasn't just God saying, "Okay, here's what I want you to to do and not do." There was uh, it said uh, a loud trumpet blast, and there was uh, fire and smoke on the mountain, and the people were afraid. But God was giving uh, the commandments, and he wanted the people to recognize that he was present with them, okay? Uh, and so uh, as we think about that, God does it again and again. Another one is when uh, the pillar of fire and cloud filled the tabernacle. When, when they built the tabernacle, they put it all in, in place and everything like that. And when they were done, God's f fire and smoke filled the tabernacle where they were to show that he was there, that he was there. And that it was later on when Solomon built the temple, you know, it was a pretty impressive thing. And when it was done, boom, there was God filling it with uh, fire and smoke to show, hey, I am here. I am, this is, this is my, my house and this is my place. So in the Acts account here, these tongues of fire show evidence of God's holy presence, power and authority, and so much more coming on those who were to speak for God. Another what now moment, not expected, but, but God was at work. And uh, I think it's an awesome thing. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Well, hasn't the Holy Spirit been around forever? Well, yeah. Huh? Uh, in the beginning, uh, the Spirit of God was upon the waters. And so, you know, we, we think of the Trinity, and I think it's important to appreciate that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they've always been there, and, and they work together. And it's important to appreciate that the Spirit's always been there, but not necessarily in the same way it was happening now. It was, it was in individuals, and God was moving uh, by his spirit in, in uh, certain circumstances. He was in uh, the prophets, obviously. He was in uh, uh, David. He was in others at times. But now the Holy Spirit is coming in a whole new way, whole new realm. And, and the people uh, had the privilege, I would say, of experiencing God's working to build the kingdom. 
So what was the nature of the speaking in other tongues? What were these disciples saying and how were people responding? Well, the nature was that these were specifically known languages and at least 15 groups are mentioned in, in the next few verses. And so uh, let's try to remember the, the circumstances here. There's a lot of people gathered because Pentecost was one of those feast times, right? That the, that the people of Israel uh, gathered for. Uh, it is only 50 days after the Passover and so a lot of people gathered for that. My guess is that some of them, or quite a few of them maybe stayed over even though they've come from all kinds of different countries. Well, they're, they're there, and we don't know for sure uh, how many were actually in this crowd that were drawn uh, by the sound of the, the, the wind and so on, but there were quite a lot of people there. And quite a few of them, obviously, uh, had not been born in Jerusalem, weren't, weren't raised there. They had come all the way from wherever, you know, several hundred miles, to be in Jerusalem for these feast days. And when they got there, many of them would have, have had other languages that they normally spoke. Probably most of them spoke some Aramaic, but that isn't how God chose to work. He decided he was going to have the disciples speak in the language of the place place where they came from and for them to hear that and be curious about that. And so when we think of, uh, of them speaking in the known languages, that's important. But then the disciples, did they know all of these languages? Well, I don't think so, <laughs> because most of them probably had never traveled to those different areas, number one. And had they even traveled there? they wouldn't necessarily have, you know, uh, learned those languages uh, that, that well. So it seems like the disciples, uh, as they were speaking these languages, um, it was the first time that they would have spoken these languages, which is interesting. Uh, have you ever, well, uh, they had these, these language learning uh, tapes or CDs, you know, and, and the minute you put it in the first time, do you speak the language that, they're, that you're trying to learn fluently? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> no, not really. But the point is that, that these were speaking and the people were understanding very clearly and knew that this was something special. Um, and um, I think the disciples, even though they were speaking whatever it was that they were saying, uh, understood what they were saying. And the question is, what were they saying? What was it that, that they were, were uh, speaking about? I mean... It wasn't uh, reciting the ABCs or something very basic or very logic. I think they were, in fact, talking about Jesus and talking about um, God's call to them and just doing so in the different languages. And so when Peter ultimately gets up and speaks, uh, they've been hearing some of the message. But how did they respond? Well, they were, first of all, confused. They didn't quite get all of this, what was going on. Um, secondly, some of them were critical. They said, oh, these guys are just drunk. <laughs> you know, they, they, they aren't really... Um, uh, something you want to pay much attention to. They're, they're just, uh, um, it's not good what they're doing. Yep. So um, as the crowd is confused, some were doubtful, some thought that they were drunk. Uh, but uh, in, if you read the next verses, and I'm not going to take the time to read this next section, but it, it explains some of this, it explains and tells what Peter is saying to the crowd and, and the, the rest of the 12, I think, I could be wrong, but I think they were still speaking and interpreting what Peter was saying. I think Peter, as he was speaking, was only speaking the one language, probably Aramaic, but uh, uh, it doesn't really matter whether it was that or Hebrew, but, but he was speaking, and the others still had these clusters of individuals from other areas who had heard their own language and were interested, and they were saying, uh, okay, this is what he said, <laughs> and they were interpreting a little bit. I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't want to make up something thing that wasn't there, but I, I want us to appreciate that if Peter is standing up and he's talking, there had to be either a miracle of everybody understanding what Peter said, even though it wasn't their native language, uh, and they would have probably had to give him a, a megaphone because you, you have 3,000, in fact, that respond, but my guess is there were at least that many more there, so probably six, 7,000 people there gathered. Whew. 
I have a loud voice when I want to, <laughs> not very often necessarily in just day to day, but I, I can speak up. But to try to talk to 6,000 people <laughs> without some kind of magni uh, magnification, you know, I know that's just, so I don't, I don't know, but I think that it's quite possible that the rest of the disciples were, were in fact talking to these still, in interpreting for them what Peter was saying and, um, and helping them to appreciate that it was significant. So Peter kind of comes to a little bit of a conclusion. There's a lot more that Peter said that isn't recorded here, I think, but, but he comes to this uh, closing part and he says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So when he's talking about all Israel, I think number one, he's talking about the people in Jerusalem, Judea, and so on, but, but all the Jews that had come from all the parts of the world were, were included this, all Israel, uh, that all Israel be assured this, that God has made Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Uh, the crucified, well, remember it was Pilate and the, the soldiers that did the actual crucifying, right? Uh, but, but who was it that was pushing it? In fact, Pilate kept trying to back away and said, oh, no, I don't see any problem here. I don't see him being guilty of what you're accusing him of. It was the Sanhedrin, the, the priests, the, the Pharisees, and by uh, extension, the crowd who were all saying, crucify him, crucify him. And so it's possible, I think it's probable, in fact, that some of the same people who were saying crucify him on the day Jesus was crucified may have even been here on the day of Pentecost 50 days later. And they probably recognized that they were involved in this, that they were involved and that it was a, a pretty serious thing. And uh, so we recognize that, that uh, Jesus was, was not only crucified, but he was resurrected. And part of the message of this day for these people was to tell about that resurrection, tell about the authority, the power of Jesus, the, the love of Jesus, the grace of Jesus, and all of that goes along with that. And so at verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Um, I don't, can't say for 100% sure I know of any of you specifically that have had heart surgery. We do, they're part of the group here. Some of them have had heart surgery. And that's a pretty serious thing, isn't it? Pretty serious thing to have heart surgery. And, and when we think about that, you know, they, at least in the old days, they cut you open, you know, and opened you up. And it's like, okay, we're going to do some work in here. And, you know, they dig around and do whatever they have to do. That's pretty serious. But when we talk about being cut to the heart, in this in the spiritual sense, that's pretty serious too. You know, to recognize, and, and I think that, that many, many people come to this point, they recognize in their heart, and the heart being the core of their very being, you know, the very the center, the very uh, essence of who they are. If they're cut to the heart, they, they recognize this is something very, 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 very serious. It's so serious, we need to do something about it. And so in this context, the heart, we could talk about being the core of our being, our emotions, our thinking, our character, our spirit. And these people are realizing that Peter's message shows them how disconnected they are from God and in big trouble if they do, don't do something, don't do something quickly. You know, uh, when we, we talk about people coming, uh, well, one of the phrases that people use, and I'm not entirely in love with it, but, oh, we had a come to Jesus moment, <laughs> you know. Uh, well, it's not just saying, oh, there's Jesus, I'm going to walk over to him. It's recognizing who we are in, in relationship to who he is and recognizing our sinfulness recognizing our falling short and how much we need him because of what he offers in his grace and mercy and love, going back to that Romans 8, 37, 39 part. And so Hebrews 4, 12, 13 puts it this way, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart the heart. The word speaks to our heart and nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him who we must give account. 
And so being cut to the heart means recognizing that, that we're accountable to God, that, that we need to come to him and let him do his work of grace within us. And if we don't, there's, there's major, major problems. So Peter replies and said, here's what you need to do. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to repent? <laughs> How many times have we talked about that <laughs> in the men's group? Uh, it's a very, very important word for us to, to appreciate and understand uh, this metanoia. And, you know, we, we might start with being sorry for the sins in our life, but that is just the very, 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 very first step. And we need to, beyond that, then surrender to the all-encompassing power, love, authority, grace, spirit of Jesus, so you can be transformed, be made alive, have a new heart, not just a physical one, which, it, which means a core being change of character and having a new spirit. Amen. Yeah. And so that, that repentance is so very, very basic in terms of coming to Jesus. We need to recognize that we're not going anywhere without him. And we need to recognize that it's our, our sin, it's our, it's our uh, attitudes and, and that, that blocks that, that transformation. And when we recognize that, then God can do something if we're open to it, if we're, if we're willing to let him do that. And so... Then it goes on and says that they're to be baptized. Well, how are they supposed to be baptized? And I think this is, this is interesting. In water, uh, let's see verse 41, and we'll talk about that more in a minute, as a sign of um, public declaration of surrender to Jesus as Lord. Um, you, you, you probably are very much aware, but there are quite a few words that are in our English language that have just been pulled out of the Greek and put in the English language because they didn't really have, a, have another word that would best describe it. But baptism is one of those. That's a Greek word. And um, it was pulled out of Greek and plugged into that. And so what does it mean to be baptized? Well, let me say first, there's a couple of uh, different um, um, examples that if you uh, read some of the Greek literature, that, that it'll pop out at you. But one of the things, for example, is a sunken ship is one that's been baptized. It's been immersed. <laughs> it's down there in the water. The water has surrounded it. And so that's obviously uh, one part of baptism, the, the, the baptism by water. Uh, but when we talk about the Spirit and being baptized with the Spirit, uh, uh, the one I like best in, in terms of describing is describing uh, some cloth. Um, and, uh, oh, Matt, you've got a lovely green shirt on there today. Uh, that uh, cloth was probably I immersed and in, in, in baptized in a, in a vat of green. <laughs> and so it might have been white to start with, but now it's green. <laughs> and so th th in the sense of baptism by the Spirit, part of what th that uh, is that happens is that the Spirit working in our lives transforms us so that we're different. You know, that we're different in the sense of, of what God can do. And so when we talk about baptism, to appreciate that. And then, of course, it needs to be in the name of Jesus. I mean, I suppose that there are people who are baptized uh, by different mm, groups. Uh, let's put it that way. And some of them are not certainly, a lot of them are not in the name of Jesus. It needs to be in the name of Jesus because Jesus is the one who has the power and the authority and the love to transform and change. So we need to appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. And so also uh, for the forgiveness of sins, Romans 3, 23, 24, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through that redemption that came by Christ. And when we when we think of that, of the sin, you know, and the being cut to the heart, I, I have to know that that there's a lot of people who don't think they're that bad. You know, they don't think that they they need God's help. They don't think that they need the grace of Jesus, the love of Jesus the saving power of Jesus. And so, uh, all, but to recognize that everybody has sin. Not one of us are, are without sin. Uh, I've thought about it this way, you know, I, I kind of think of myself as a eh, not too bad a guy. I mean, you know, I, I, I live life. But, but even if I only committed one sin a day for all of my life, 
that'd be several thousand sins, and that's not good, <laughs> you know? Even if I only committed one sin a week, which is ridiculous, I mean, I know I do more than that. Ah, that's still a lot of sin. And so all of us have sinned and fall short, but by the grace of God, we are justified freely uh, through the redemption that came in Christ. And then 1 John 1, 9, I suppose this is one of my favorites, but if we confess our sins, if we recognize what we've done, and if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and not just forgive us, but cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, yeah, I think of, uh, of washing clothes, and, and if there's a stain in some clothes, boy, it's pretty hard to get that stain out sometimes, you know. We can wash it and wash it and wash it, but what Jesus does is cleanses us, purifies us from all unrighteousness. Wow, wow. Now, when we talk about a now what moment, it's like, how did you do that? <laughs> you know, that's, that's grace. And uh, you might? Do you mind if I interject sometimes? Yeah, uh, well. You always have to do it. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I am so impressed with what you're saying because what I'm hearing is this, in this moment where we say now what, what we're really seeing is unexpected. <laughs> what always happens when we have our eyes open yep. is we see the glory of God. Yeah. When yeah. we finally realize it. What? That's it's right. Not what is expected, but this is what it was about. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and and if we if we only had that openness, you know, that that um, hope and expectation that God was going to be working in our is going to be working in our lives. So uh, then the other part of that is that in terms of being baptized, receive, be baptized by the gift of the Holy Spirit, thus be in that transformation process and being filled so that there's no room for evil or sin, you know. Uh, you know, it's one thing to, to say, okay, I got to deal with the sin, boom, you know, and we deal with it and God's grace is there and he forgives and he, and he loves us and so we're forgiven. But if we get up from that and immediately go out and sin some more, ooh, that's a problem. Or if we just sit there and say, oh, now I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. Don't, you know, I don't have to do anything more. I'm saved, I'm forgiven, that's wonderful. You know. No, uh, verse uh, 43 to 45 in Matthew 12 says something about that. When an evil spirit comes out of a man, and remember Jesus cast out evil spirits all the time, it goes through in married places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I'll return to the house house I left when it arrives and finds the house uh, unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is worse than the first. That's how it'll be with this wicked generation. Ooh! To recognize that it's not just being emptied of, but filled with and transformed by the presence, the power of God, the working of God. Oof, that's so, so very, very, very important. And to recognize that there are forces of evil, you know, and we see it all around us, don't we? All these forces of evil, if we only recognize that if we submit to the power of Jesus, he has power over those forces and sources of evil. 39, the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call for you, ongoing. You know, when we, we talk about even receiving the, the, being baptized and receiving the Holy Spirit, it's for that moment, certainly. <laughs> but oh, please don't let it stop there, you know. The Holy Spirit needs to be working in us day by day by day, and we'll get deeper in our, our uh, relationship with Jesus and the, uh, His power at work within us if we just, if we keep on, you know, keep on. And, and when we're going through life and the, the, the what now moments happen, to recognize that, okay, God is with me, God loves me, now what God, what now God are you going to do here today? You know, what are you going to do in me today? Ooh, so very, very important. And it's not just for you, but you, filled with the Spirit, can pass it on to your children, to your family. If you have the, uh, the love of Christ in you, that he can work in you to influence other people. Mike, you know? Well, really, it's, it's not only Challenges all those that have been born free again all the Holy Spirit and go feed my sheep. Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah, and, and that feeding is a, you know, you, you don't feed sheep just once and then they're done. You know, it's every day, isn't it? You know, we got to gotta keep on feeding. So it's for the children and the family who aren't there. They needed to, to take what they were experiencing and go and share it with others. And he says, where it's far off ones, including the Gentiles. And, you know, even though Jesus uh, indeed did touch Gentiles in his, his ministry and in his healing, um, Peter didn't completely fully get that, that, it, that the message was for everybody, including the Gentiles and so we come to chapter 10 in Acts and another now what moment uh, when uh, Peter has a vision and the, the sheets let down remember and there's all kinds of animals clean and unclean on it and, and the Lord tells him to get up and eat and I, I think Peter liked food I think he was a food guy <laughs> but the point is that that uh, Peter said well some of these things are okay but a, but a lot of them I'll, I'll never eat those and and so the vision happens and then then the men come and he goes to Cornelius house uh, uh, a Roman soldier and and basically uh, a Gentile obviously and and uh, God is showing him that that it's for everybody and in fact I love it that passage because because Peter's starting to talk with them and while he's talking even the Holy Spirit comes upon them and Peter didn't have any idea that that was going to happen but it did and God was at work, and so, so we have to appreciate that it's for everybody. And the kingdom is growing and will continue to grow. The what now keeps on happening. And as you look at the rest of the, the book of Acts, how many more things happen? So with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. What was corrupt about the generation back then, would you say, just, just quick? What, what was corrupt about the generation back then? A lot of what was corrupt back there is what we see presently in our own generation. Yeah, yeah. In the last several generations. Yeah. We become so gaudy and we have um, what's happening in the world we become so gaudy that they basically push God out of their lives. Yeah. And they adorn themselves with all the silver and the gold oh, yeah. yep. and all the ways yep. of the world yep. seen about them yep. more and more less godly now. Yeah. And, and it didn't matter how oh, you were going to say something like they, they didn't recognize Jesus. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it didn't matter how much they knew even about the, the, the scriptures. I mean, the Pharisees, they studied it like crazy, you know, and they studied it. But they didn't have the heart relationship. Right? We go back to that, don't we? That heart relationship with Jesus. They didn't have the heart relationship with God. And so it was a corrupt generation. Jesus came along and said the things he did, and they didn't like it because they were not connected with God. And what you're saying. Okay. They didn't have the heart because they didn't repent. Okay, yeah. The word repent. Yeah. I'm, I'm the one that always preaches this one. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So you're going to let me. <laughs> and the word repent is metanoia. Yep. Metanoia isn't just saying, I'm sorry for my sin. It's a change of your attitude. Yeah. It says, Jesus' disciples and Jesus says, you've got to hear it different than you have before. Yeah. When you are able to hear it different, when you change your heart, that's repentance. Yeah. You're able to hear it different than you did before. Yeah. And all of a sudden, there's no longer my righteousness, my faithfulness, my attendance at the temple yeah. that got me there. Yeah. It's now, I'm hearing it a new way. Yeah. Salvation is yeah. in Jesus. Yeah. He who has ears to hear, yeah, it's, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, Doug? Yeah. Like they are saying nowadays, that everyone is doing whatever is right in their own mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not recognizing what real right is, or, you know, what real truth is, and all that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so that generation, this generation, and the, every generation, there's been corruptness, you know. Um, I don't know, we could probably think of a hundred examples of, of things, something being corrupted, but, you know, uh, if it's not the purity, that God has desired and intends, then it's corrupt, you know, yeah. And, and so that's so important. So those who accepted this message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. And uh, the question is how much water was available for baptizing and how many uh, people were doing the baptizing. Uh, there's at least uh, three pools that were not far from the temple, uh, pool, Israel pool, sheep pool, pool of Siloam, and maybe a couple couple of others that were not too far away. If just the 12 were baptizing 
and I think it was more than that, but if just the 12, do you know how long that would take? <laughs> I remember uh, in one service one time, um, uh, quite a few years ago, uh, baptizing 26 people in one service. And it took an hour <laughs> because you would pray for each one and, you know, you'd a minute for them to get in and out and all that sort of thing. Um, and it, oh, just a very exciting moment, certainly, for that many. But 3,000? Well, it would take probably one minute each, about four hours. <laughs> and so my guess is that there maybe were even some, some of the other 120 that were helping out with this. And it isn't nearly, it, well, it's not important at all. Who is the one who puts you down into the water and brings you back up? What is important is the receiving Jesus and experiencing Jesus and letting Jesus come, come into your life and be Lord as well as Savior. And so that baptism took place and uh, it, it took a... It's your first act in the name of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And a very, a very, very important. It's the, it's the first step, you know, it's like a baby learning how to walk. Well, I made that step, now I gotta make another one. You know? And the, the, the making another one is the what now moments that go through life, I would say. Okay, so how did the Holy Spirit work or manifest itself in each one baptized that day? A very interesting question. I would say this, as I said a little bit earlier, that it was unique for each one because God isn't necessarily about carbon copy. <laughs> you know, he, he interacts with each person where they are and in the way that they need to, to respond to the message. And so I suppose some of them spoke in tongues. I suppose that some of them, um, you know, were healed. I don't know. I, all kinds of different ways. But the Holy Spirit was working. And the fact that it was working and that they were becoming a part of the kingdom is what's really the key thing. And it's just one step in the positive what now, now what progression. And we can check out, as I said, the rest of the book of Acts and whatever happens, know that God and Jesus are near and that the Holy Spirit's ready and eager to transform all who will allow him to do his work. Well, I hope that's been a little bit interesting and helpful. Oh, how much we need to recognize that what's going on in our world is not good. In so many ways, it's not good. And uh, our tendency is to say, oh, woe is us. But may we, on the other hand, be recognizing that God is there. God is in, has the authority. He gave Jesus the power and the authority to transform. And I just want us to know that whatever's going on, we may not be able to, to do a lot about, but we can be expectant that God is at work. Well, let me close in prayer, Mike, okay? Father, we do thank you for your word. And we thank you for your spirit. And we thank you for your grace and love and mercy. And appreciating that nothing can separate us from your love. Help us to just keep remembering that. And to know that in spite of everything that's going on, you're there and you love us. And you can do good in our lives as we show that we love you and are letting you be called according to your purposes. Oh, Lord, help us, help us, help us, help us. And thank you for the privilege to share today. In Jesus' name, amen.